Okay, everyone, um, welcome to lecture 11. And so I have a feeling that Wednesday is only going to have one lecture. <laughs> I'm still grading exams, as I'm sure many of you have guessed. Um, the deal is if I don't get them graded by midnight after seven days, so by Wednesday night at midnight, you guys, extra get, you guys get extra credit points. My goal is to have them back to you before then. Okay, and by the way, from what I can tell, most all of you rocked the exam, and I was very, very happy. I'm just still grading, though. Okay, so one lecture for Wednesday, and I'll try to put two up for Friday so you guys have a lot of good information. Um, also, once everything is graded, um, I will make sure that we go over that genetic cross, the gene mapping question. You guys, all of you did really well. You were Most of you were so close, and some of you got it. So I was really excited. Um, you guys are doing really great. So what we're going to talk about today is species concepts. And we'll talk about the biological species concept, morphological species, all sorts of other good stuff. We'll talk about speciation. There's two different examples. You can have allopatric, where you have a geographic barrier, and sympatric, where you don't. We'll also talk about reproductive isolation, because this is what leads to speciation. Okay, so a lot of good stuff to cover today. So the first thing we have to address is really what is a species. Okay, and so... Technically, as defined, um, a group of individuals that actually or potentially interbreeds in nature. So, in this sense, a species is the biggest gene pool possible under natural conditions. Now, it can actually be really hard to recognize species boundaries in natural populations. Um, a lot of times you'll have, you know, uh, different species that, that are very different from one another, but they look a lot alike. And then you'll have others that actually look very different, but it turns out they're the same species. It kind of depends on what your criteria are. So nature is actually pretty cool and kind of follows their own rules. So two great examples of two different species that are distinct from one another, but they look very much alike, are the monarch, okay, and the viceroy. And so if you look, the monarchs on the bottom, remember monarchs are the ones that um, eat the milkweed and they're really awesome. They're absolutely beautiful butterflies. The viceroy is not the same species as the monarch, but if you look at the two of them, they look very, very similar. And so if you were to see them in the wild, you might not be able to distinguish them not knowing that they're two different species. Now the typical um, species concept that most biologists use is known as the biological species concept, okay? And so this is where you have the species are defined as groups or actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations. They're reproductively isolated from one another, okay? And so the whole idea is that the emphasis is on reproductive isolation. So what I want you to do is stop lecture, take a moment, and write some advantages for using this concept and some disadvantages for using this concept, okay? And remember, the whole idea are the biological species are, you know, if they were to meet, they would not be able to mate and they could not produce fertile offspring. So some advantages of using the BSC is that it's widely used by biologists and so proponents say that when you define species this way, they're real biological entities. And remember, reproductive isolation means evolutionary independence, okay? Now the disadvantages are that you really can't apply this to all species. What are you going to do with extinct ones, okay? Um, how in the world do you treat asexual organisms? And, you know, when can you really understand um, when species do not overlap geographically? Are you supposed to bring them together and see if they can potentially then interbreed or not? And don't even get me started on the plant kingdom because plants do their own crazy things where they'll actually share and, you know, duplicate entire genomes with another distinct species and they just break all the rules because, you know, they're plants, they're cool, and they do what they want. Now, once again, I'm sorry the spacing is a little goofy, but there are other species concept, okay? One is known as the morpho species concept where you basically, well, actually, I would like you to take a moment and I would like you to stop and based on your <coughs> readings <coughs> that I know you've done for today, I want you to define the morpho species concept, okay? In addition to that, I want you to stop lecture and also define the phylogenetic species concept. Now, while you're doing this, okay, it would be an excellent potential exam question to ask you the advantages and disadvantages and to compare and contrast each of these and maybe come up with some examples. Why wouldn't that be a great exam question? Hint. Okay, so <laughs> trying to teach you all how I think. Okay, now I can't guarantee I'm going to remember to put this on the exam. I'm just trying to teach you how I think and get you guys prepared because, you know, I want you to keep rocking the exams like you've been doing. So the morpho species concept, as I'm sure you wrote down from reading your textbook, hint, 
um, defined by morphological characteristics. And so you're looking at those that share many features um, and you make them consider one species. Now, are there some problems with this? For example, when you have sexually dimorphic species, okay, that makes things really challenging. Additionally, you can have mimics. And so the viceroy and monarch examples, by the way, that's an example of mimicry. Write that down. Viceroy, monarchs, mimicry. Okay. And, it, and then we other, um, sorry, our other species concept is a phylogenetic species concept. And what you're doing is you're defined by unique genetic history. Okay. And so you have an independent branch tip on a phylogenetic tree, and that's considered to be a species. And so what I'd like you to do is think about maybe some advantages and disadvantages with either of these methods. We talked about some problems with the morpho species concept. I want you to keep going and think of advantages and disadvantages. Now, one great example where things can get a little dicey when it comes to how you define a species are in meadowlarks. So we have what are called eastern and western meadowlarks, and they have distinct songs. Now, hopefully you guys watched the, um, the uh, lecture from last week where you guys had the uh, uh, Greater Liar Bird. Awesome songs. Okay, if you didn't listen to that, go do it now. All right. What I'm going to do to have you guys listen to this, by the way, is I'm going to have one slide with one bird and the other slide with the other bird. So I'm going to try and load the eastern meadowlark first in the first slide, and then the second slide I'm going to try and upload the western meadowlark. Okay, so what I want you to do is listen to the two songs, and then given that information, address this question. Would they be considered different species? And then, what about the morpho species concept? Would they be considered different species? Okay. And again, I'm trying to have you learn to think the way they um, want you to for your bio classes. I know our lectures or our exams are not multiple choice, but I'm trying to get you ready for those multiple choice exams that are most likely going to be in your future. Okay. So hopefully those videos loaded for you. Um, if they didn't, download the PowerPoint version of our lecture today and go to those links because they have them too. And if you did listen to them, hopefully you realize that um, would they be considered different species? And the answer to that is yes, because if they have different mating songs, um, the females are not going to be able to recognize the males if they have, you know, don't have the right song. And then what about the morpho species concept? Well, no, these guys look really, really close, you know, look like they're closely related, but they're not. So, you know, even if they met, they would not mate and produce fertile offspring. So, you know, something to consider. Okay, so we're going to actually look at some data from a true, real study. Okay, so using actual data from a study on salamanders, what I want you to do is categorize these guys into three species, A, B, and C. Now, I realize that you don't know much other than what they look like, okay, so, but it's going to be interesting when we make the comparison of um, who's actually related to who versus what might appear. And what I want you to also realize is each species might have one or more than one of these guys in that group, okay? So um, go ahead and, and categorize your species, stop lecture, and then once you're ready, um, get lecture going again, and we can move to the next slide. So this is where I would like you to put your proposed phylogenies, by the way. So stop here, write your phylogenies in there, and then let's see what happens. So what you were doing previously is putting them into you know groups um, and designating species based on the morpho species concept. Well what researchers did was they actually examined using the phylogenetic species concept and believe it or not this is what they found okay so what this does illustrate is how much the species concepts can differ and additionally you know how the relationships can differ depending upon what criteria you use so definitely very interesting again my preference is biological species concept with exception of the plants who just kind of do their own thing um you know but you guys decide Okay, so now what we're going to focus on is the allopatric, speci um, allopatric speciation. And so in order to have allopatric speciation, you have to have some sort of barrier that is usually, you know, geographic and it blocks the two, the two populations from exchanging genes. So remember, speciation is the formation of distinct species by genetic divergence, and this leads to reproductive isolation. Okay, and so you'll have a common ancestor in your tree, and then your population splits into two different species, all right, and then they diverge. So this generally starts when gene flow is interrupted. That's known as genetic isolation. Most often when populations are geographically separated, this is the allopatric speciation part. And under some conditions, this can actually occur without geographic separation, and that's known as sympatric speciation, and we'll talk about that one a little bit later.
So a nice general model to think of this is, you know, you have some sort of initial barrier to gene flow that emerges. Now humans have actually created some barriers to gene flow. Um, let's say you're a snail population and your population ends up on either side, split between two sides of an eight lane highway. You can imagine that not a whole lot of gene flow is going to go on in between there, especially as slow as snails move. The idea then is that for step two, the genetic makeup of each population will change, okay, through either natural selection, genetic drift, and or mutation, or all of the above. Reproductive isolating mechanisms will then evolve so that even if the geographic barrier disappeared, the species could not um, come back, the two different species could not come back and create fertile offspring. Oh look, some notes with a happy face, write this down. Um, genetic isolation again due to separation in space or time, okay, and then genetic divergence is step two. Now, reproductive isolating mechanisms, there's a wide variety of these, okay? And this, according to the BSC, is what will result in new species. So what the next couple of slides do is they show you a nice generic example of speciation. You have a single interbreeding population, gets split into two. Okay, the two populations diverge genetically. They have different mutations. Some become fixed in the populations over time. Eventually, this leads to speciation because... Even if they were to come back together, they'd no longer be able to produce fertile offspring. Something I'd like you to consider, oh look, more notes. Um, your your um, single population that eventually splits, this might or might not involve spatial separation. Because remember, we're going to talk about sympatric speciation, which is going to be, you know, show an example where they don't geographically split. The other thing to consider, now, this is not a rule for everybody, but generally speciation is a gradual process, okay? However, what I want you to keep in mind is what could potentially influence this. Well, generation time, okay, mutation rate, and all sorts of other things, including dog barking. <laughs> Just illustrating another example, we have our population of the same species become subdivided geographically, might be separated by colonizing a new island, have or by mountains, oceans, rivers. Once they're separated, though, evolution can proceed independently. And so, you know, allopatric speciation is most common, motor speciation in animals, okay? Um, again, we've said this before, plants kind of do their own thing. And so the whole idea is when the gene pools are sufficiently different, Fertile offspring cannot be produced between the two, even if, um, you know, the barrier is to come down. So when that happens, the speciation is said to be complete. Again, sorry about the spacing. The program doesn't seem to like PowerPoint. Anyway, um, different ways that evolution can proceed independently in the populations. You can have mutation, of course, natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, all sorts of other good stuff. And any of those will cause your populations to diverge from each other. So, one real-life example with regards to allopatric speciation is through what's known as vicariance. And so, if you've done your reading, ahem, you know how to define vicariance, ahem, um, in which case, you know, three million years ago, there was interbreeding between Eastern Pacific and Caribbean populations because you could have water flow and shrimp moving back and forth. However, today, as we know, um, that was closed off, okay, and so they are no longer able to interbreed once, um, you know, the uh, sea levels dropped and the land bridges, uh, land bridges formed. So now there's a separation and they've definitely become two distinct species. Now, researchers questioned when this, that this speciation event actually took place. So they wanted to know, um, relative to separation of the Pacific and the Caribbean, what does this tree suggest based on genetic data? Okay, so what I want you to do is stop lecture and think about, all right, so if speciation happened before the separation of the Pacific and Caribbean populations, what would your tree look like? Okay, if it happened after separation of those two populations, what would it look like? Or there is a potential for both. Okay, so what I want you to do is to take your time, stop and think about what it should look like for A to be true, for B to be true, and for C to be true. And then once you're ready, start up lecture again and we'll chat. So let's look at our tree again. And remember, every single node is a different species, okay, based on genetic data. What we see here is that, for example, we at the very bottom of the tree, we see Pacific 7 prime and Pacific 7. So those are two distinct species, okay? And so they have been distinct species for a long time, and most likely they predated the formation of the Isthmus Canal, okay? Okay. 
So compare that to the two right above it where you have Pacific 2 and Caribbean 2. So those likely speciated afterwards because they are separated, you know, um, from a geographic perspective. This suggests that it's the answer is C, both before and after. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Just think about, you know, most of the speciation based on this tree and what we see seem to happen afterwards, but there are a few examples where it did seem to happen before. Nicely done, everyone. Now it's time for us to go ahead and talk about sympatric speciation, in which case, when this happens, the barrier is not from a geographic perspective, it's biological. So something happens to where your, your, your individuals can no longer breed and produce fertile offspring, according to the BSC. So remember, you have speciation without geographic separation. Initially, your individuals are coexisting, but then there's some sort of genetic mutation that restricts or stops gene flow. Okay, so the populations are isolated, but they're not geographically isolated. They're isolated from the perspective of um, they're reproductively isolated, and it's called in sympatry because they're in the same place. So sometimes gene flow can be res restricted even when populations are not geographically separated, and so the initial barrier to gene flow is biological. So you might be asking yourself, what could one of those barriers be? Well, one example would be genetic. Let's say you had a chromosomal change, you could have an inversion, something that basically happens instantly, okay? Additionally, a second mechanism would be ecological, perhaps shifting hosts, going from one host to another one that has happened before. And last but not least, behavioral, okay, where there might be a change in mating dance or something along those lines where there's definitely a change in mate preference. So a great example of this, again, sympatric speciation, everybody's living as one. Then you have some sort of disruptive selection, which, you know, you maintain your variation because this is going to be divergent selection or disruptive selection. Eventually, the subpopulations will diverge, okay, to where they are no longer able to come back and have fertile offspring. Therefore, they're considered to be two different species. So what you have to consider, though, is that your disruptive selection has to be something that is reproductive in nature. So like sexual selection or something that's going to lead to genetic incompatibility. Okay, so what I just want you to do is sort of think of this from the broader perspective about how could this actually happen. Now, we mentioned earlier that sympatric speciation could occur through a host shift. And a great example of this are the apple mega flies. And yes, they sound gross, but from a biological perspective, they're incredibly cool. So about 300 years ago, we only had hawthorn trees over here in North America. And so these guys only laid their eggs on hawthorn fruit. However, apples eventually were introduced, okay? And so then they were able to lay eggs on the hawthorns and the apples. Females would generally choose to lay their eggs on the type of fruit they grew up in, okay? And males tended to look for mates on the type of fruit they grew up in. And eventually this would lead to the separation of the two species. And so ultimately what happens is gene flow is reduced between the populations and this allows them to speciate, okay, meaning they will become different species. Now the reason it's still sympatric is because you could have two trees right next to one another, okay, that the flies could practically, you know, cross back and forth and it doesn't matter. It's because they shifted hosts and so then they started to prefer mates that were in the same host tree as them. So again, the first thing that we do when we see a graph is we look at the axes, okay? So we have percent of individuals that fly to the scent. So the green being the apple flies, the red being the hawthorn scent, the gray being both, and then the purple being no scent, okay? So and again, less than 300 years ago, when apple trees were actually introduced, um, you know, some of the flies started using apples as hosts. Now you might be asking the question, why? Well, let's think about it. So why might they want to shift to a new host? Well definitely less competition there, probably, you know, a whole lot of space, okay, so um, that they could then develop and take over. So given that, you're going to have natural selection on many fly traits, okay. What we can see here, though, are the apple flies tend to fl fly towards the apple scent, and the hawthorn flies tend to fly towards the hawthorn scent. So the question is, what type of selection is reducing gene flow between these two populations? Is it A, B, C, or D. So this should be a piece of cake given what we just talked about. So given this information, what we talked about, this is disruptive selection because the apple flies are going towards the apple scent, the hawthorn flies are going towards the hawthorn scent, okay? Now what I'd like you to pay attention to is the fact that there are still some flies that will go towards both scents, 
and still some flies that will go towards no scent. Okay, so from an evolutionary perspective, the question is, what does that actually mean? So what this means, according to the data, is that speciation is still underway. So it's been 300 years since apples were introduced to North America, and the speciation is not yet complete, because you still get flies that will be attracted to both scents, and they're still producing fertile offspring, as you can see by the overlap in the graph here. So, you know, it takes a little time for certain speciation, but it also depends on what type of speciation happens. If you have a chromosomal inversion, that can make things change very, very quickly. Now, plants are an excellent example of sympatric speciation by what's called polyploidy. So you can get errors during meiosis, which can lead to extra sets of chromosomes in gametes and offspring. If you get an entire extra set, that's known as polyploidy. Okay, so when this happens, you can get 3N or 4N mutants, and they're not able to breed with the 2N individuals, and therefore they become a new species. Okay, this happens in plants very commonly, and it can be as fast as one generation. And a lot of our um, grain cereals and a lot of our crops that we actually depend on today evolved this way. Okay, so plants, once again, super awesome, and we don't give them enough credit. Now, just something to be aware of, there's what's called autopolyploidy, where both um, chromosome sets come from the same parental species, auto meaning self, okay? And so what this is showing here is that you have the parent species where 2n equals 6, you get this meiotic error where you have self-fertilization, and then all of the chromosomes there are, are basically get doubled, and therefore you go from 4n equals 6 to sorry, 2n equals 6 to 4n equals 12. But because they all come from that same plant, okay, that's where the auto comes in. All right, now it's time for us to discuss reproductive isolation. So we have what's known as prezygotic and postzygotic, and in the next slide we'll go into more detail, the next couple of slides we'll go into more detail about what those mean. Now, so once again, how might this occur? Just remember, you got to start out with your initial barrier to gene flow. In this case, it's going to be an example where you got a geographic barrier. The genetic makeup of each population changes, okay? And then you, these reproductive isolating mechanisms will evolve. Now, the whole idea is that these ice, reproductive isolation could be either prezygotic, okay, or postzygotic. Now, <clears throat> that reading again. <laughs> If you've done the reading, you know what both of these mean, and you can fill in and define each of these. Now, the prezygotic isolating mechanisms, as I'm sure you guessed, um, is in the word, okay? So basically, you're preventing mating or fertilization. It's before the zygote forms. So no hybrid zygotes can form, okay? Now, there's also the postzygotic, meaning after the zygote forms, okay? And so what happens is you have fertilization, you have this hybrid zygote, but either the hybrid can't live, or if it lives, it's not able to reproduce and, and make fertile offspring. Now, when it comes to prezygotic isolating barriers, there's many different kinds, okay? So here we have one example that I would like you guys to fill in the blank where you have species that use different courtship signals. What type of prezygotic barrier might that be? And then I want you to consider if you have species that live in the same area but use different habitats, what, what would be the name for that prezygotic isolating barrier? So take a moment, stop lecture, fill this out, and when you're ready, go ahead and continue. Hopefully the first one sounded behavioral to you and that would actually be the correct answer because we're talking about courtship signals. The second one is ecological or spatial, because even though they're in the same area, they start to use different habitats and they don't run into one another anymore. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Then let's go on for a second example of these. Additional types include um, species breeding at different times, and there's a name for that, <laughs> time, <laughs> hint. <laughs> okay, and then we also have an example where you can have anatomical differences between individuals that prevent mating. Okay, so um, one example would be in fruit flies, different species will have different genitalia, and so, you know, also species of plants will have different pollinators based on who they're trying to attract, so give me the name for that particular term as well. Stop lecture and give it your best shot. Hopefully temporal sounds familiar, time, okay? And then the second example in this slide is mechanical, because it's actually anatomical differences that prevent the mating. You can also have a situation where the gametes of the species meet, but they don't fuse. So one example, egg and sperm are different coral, and urchin species are not compatible. They have chemical signals that will not allow them to try and cross, and that's what keeps them as individual species.
And so I'd like you to consider the name of that and um, should be relatively easy. Hopefully the term gametic makes sense, okay? And as I said, the, it's kind of in the name and, um, or it's in the, in the hint, all right? And so if you have any questions, let me know. Now, there's also a couple of different post-zygotic isolating barriers. So one example is when the hybrid embryo or the hybrid juvenile dies, okay? And one example in particular is in the genus Rana where the hybrid frogs are frail and usually don't complete development. So think about what the name of this particular barrier might be and stop lecture for a second and give it a shot. Hopefully the phrase hybrid incompatibility or inviability sounds familiar because basically, you know, the hybrids just are not compatible and so they're not able to survive, okay? So, all right, one more example and um, we'll be getting close to the end of lecture. Another example of a post-zygotic isolating barrier is when your hybrid offspring live but they're unable to reproduce. So one of the main reasons for this is that they don't have the right number of chromosomes to be able to reproduce. Um, did you know that seedless watermelon is actually created this way? So back when I was growing up, and I hate saying this, but it's very true, um, all watermelon had seeds. Well, everybody knows that they're kind of a pain. And these days when you go to the grocery store, um, you will very often see seedless watermelon. And have you ever wondered to yourself how that was actually created? Well, what um, researchers did is they took different watermelon strains with different numbers of chromosomes. For example, one that had maybe four, four chromosomes and another one that had three chromosomes, and they crossed them. But the reason that they are infertile is because they can't go through meiosis and form gametes with the proper number of chromosomes. So the seeds are aborted, and that's how you have seedless watermelon. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. <laughs> Okay, maybe I need to get out more, but it's still cool. <laughs> uh, there's examples, and we've talked about this before um, a little bit, that you know animals are particularly sensitive to not having the right number of chromosomes, but you can have a horse and a donkey, and hopefully you have a female horse and a male donkey, produces a mule, and they're sterile because they don't have the right number of chromosomes. Another example is crossing a lion and a tiger. They do have offspring that live, but again, they're sterile because they don't have the right number of chromosomes. So back to our initial question of how fast do new species form, well, it kind of depends on a number of factors. If gene flow is completely cut off or if there's still some gene flow between the two populations. How far they can disperse, okay? The size of the populations. Remember, smaller populations, um, genetic drift will cause them to diverge quicker. How different are the two habitats? Because that will impact the strength of natural selection, okay? So average time is two to three million years, can be much longer, can be much shorter. In some plants, um, more common in plants and animals, it can even be instantaneous. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is read this question and then do the best to answer this question to the best of your abilities. Stop lecture. This is practice. It's good practice. And when you're ready, go ahead and flip the slide. Hopefully this makes sense and you went with choice C. So they, are, they do geographically overlap, but they occupy different portions of the habitat. That information is not given to you randomly. Okay, and so lions will be in open grassland, tigers live in the forest, and so that's basically ecological isolation and it's prezygotic because it keeps the zygote from ever even forming. Once again, a very cool real life example. Take your time, read through this, stop lecture. When you're ready, choose your answer, and then after you've chosen your answer, go ahead and start up lecture again. Okay, so hopefully it makes sense that this is prezygotic because it usually, generally prevents the zygote from ever being formed, and it's mechanical isolation because they're really not able to fit together properly on their own. Okay, so one more question. Okay, so what type of isolation? Read through the scenario, stop lecture, choose your answer, and then when you're ready, go ahead and continue. Hopefully this makes sense. It's post-zygotic because the hybrid is formed, but the hybrids are sterile, okay? So, all right, so again, today we're only gonna have one lecture for Wednesday. Please make sure you're caught up on the lectures, all right? Um, you don't wanna get behind, and this class goes really quickly. Friday, my goal is to have two lectures up for all of you.
So once again, um, once I get this lecture uploaded and everything is all set for you guys for Wednesday, I'm going to go back to grading your exams. If I don't get them graded by tomorrow night at midnight, you guys all get an extra credit point. You don't need it though, because from what I can tell, most of you did a really great job on the exam and I am incredibly pleased. Okay. So I wish you a wonderful day. Stay safe as always. And I will talk to you soon. And if you need anything, I will be in office hours. Um, tomorrow from let's say two to three since Monday was a holiday. Talk to you soon.